with regards to the case that I will describe is on what I've used in, to be honest, about 90% of the courses that I teach. I teach, I'll be very um, transparent, I teach mostly, if not all at this current point, um, postgraduate students in the master's level. Um, and so I teach more at the master's level than I do teach at the undergraduate level, but I am in charge of the undergraduate level in my current role as deputy dean. So I do have a good mix of the two. With regards to this, these are mostly in my courses that I teach, and this is the one of the various tools that um, I utilize to get at inclusive pedagogy and critical inclusive pedagogy using social blogging, or what I'm now realizing is more critical social blogging um, because of the critical matters that the students are asked to look at and that they choose and then form agency around. And so the assignment is graded. It is given a weighting in the assessment. And I say this because of the following. All of our postgrad programs and course outlines are kind of cookie cutter in terms of their standard with the written formats um, and the number of essays that they're supposed to do or research papers and the word count. There was a common complaint, however, when I got into the faculty um, over five years ago, that the students are not at a good writing, academic writing level, reading level, or speaking engagement level. And, the, and then, so that complaint kept on coming out from colleagues and saying that we are putting back into the classrooms, so into schools, um, into the Ministry of Education or graduates, that could not produce or write critically, write for argument, and write um, poignantly with purpose. And so I started to question from our own students, what is it? These are the complaints. Why is this happening? And so I had cut our essays, the standard essay that you turn in at the, either the midterm or at the end of the term, and started having the students write in real time on a blog um, format and so using, replacing the essays, but putting them in an electronic format in their own course um, blog site. And so this is the blog site essentially. I have just picked up one of many. This is the course that is on trends and issues in higher education. I've also used it on resource management courses. I've used it on a research methods and statistics course that I also teach. Um, because what I found is that if, for my students, if they could not connect to the course content, I lost them in the first iteration of understanding how to read for academic literacy and then how to write for academic literacy. And so one of the assignment, and I don't know if it was shared on the case, but I can share it with you. I know I shared it with Josephine is that they are to pick a critical issue happening through a various dispositions and examples of blogs. And then they are supposed to just suppose their lived experiences within those writings so that they can analyze what they're reading better and then thereafter critique it. And they are to critique for purpose of change or purpose of amendment or purpose of solution. So if you're seeing some of the headlines, they're picking apart cries for justice, issues and recommendations to stem the tide of global strikes by lecturers across the world, developing digital literacy, mental health in higher education, um, funding higher education. Um, there was also, and then I'll show you another one that's coming up right afterwards. And so the students were picking these topics and they were writing it using standard academic language. Um, they were also practicing um, what we grade through, which is APA writing, but they were also being judged on creativity they were being judged, um, I mean, assessed on their lived experiences, how to relate those throughout the end. They were being assessed on their writing, on community and forming community, because they would have to critique on other of their classmates' um, slides, blogs as well. Some students took it to a whole different level. They were motivated to do a video blog, and so vlogging. 
this student in particular, Vestino, asked her permission, actually really was, uh, and really was engrossed and wanted to deal with a current issue that we're facing in our higher education system on sexual harassment um, throughout higher education. And she wanted to present it as a video. And so she did a vlog instead. And it took shape forms where she has now presented it across Canada, parts of the United States, and throughout the Caribbean as well. And what it actually did for her is motivated her in many ways to start up um, change seminars as well as uh, be a part of various movements on campuses and across the country um, that look at the equivalent to what the U.S. has, the Me Too movement. And so it really propelled her into a different creating agency. So the steps to consider though, when you want to use similar tools, and I'm sure that there are many, um, and to similar tools is how do you model for your students what is considered a good blog? The first thing that my students actually always ask, well, what is a good blog um, doc? And I always let them know that for me, I don't necessarily look for something that's good or bad in those binaries but to look at what is critical. Are you calling for change, for agency? Are you positioning an argument that um, you can see yourself looking at five years from now after you have received the degree, right? How does it help you beyond to change some community? And so to demonstrate how to also navigate the system, as I was saying, we have a lot of non-traditional students and for the first time, their assessments are being judged technically or using technology that they may not be comfortable with. When they're not comfortable with the technology, it becomes a barrier in and of itself. And so a lot of time is spent on showing them how to navigate the blog site. Because for the most times, this is the first time the student is actually reading a blog and definitely writing their own blog and having it shown to their classmates as well, right? Then explain the purpose. I am transparent and authentic in my pedagogy to let the students know that I'm not having you do this work just for a grade or an assignment, but it has a larger a purpose and context to why you're getting the degree and what do you want to use it for later on. And so they understand that there is really, uh, you know, real intent with designing of these assessment points. I do speak about the hidden curriculum sometimes, which becomes very much unhidden to my students, about their writing levels. That if you want to make changes, oftentimes it's not good enough to be able to communicate with the community, but those who can actually enhance the changes, whether it's the policy holders or policy makers. Then um, review the rubric and assessment so that they're fully cognizant about what they're being assessed for. And then utilize other media, social media and blog, blog platforms so students can see examples of varying types. So some of the critical outcomes mapping back to inclusive pedagogy that we know we have seen and we have researched over the past 20 years of almost 20 years, 16 years of doing this work are the academic outcomes, the diversity outcomes, and the civic outcomes in particular, where there are educational aspirations, self-confidence, critical thinking, problem-solving abilities, the diversity outcomes about cultural awareness globally, especially given the blogs that I will share with the students are across a global spectrum, um, fosters this um, creative yearning and innovation, and then the civic outcomes, of course, in terms of how does it strengthen their own commitment to equity and justice overall, even if they're doing statistics and p-values. So I had pulled another question, but I'm open to questions that may be coming, might come in the chat room. Perfect. Thank you so much, Sharan. Um, it's also wonderful to see that in the webinar so far, we've been discussing the case of OD Faculty Fellows, which is about embedding and practicing inclusive education on different levels. Um, and we also discussed now two examples of curriculum development um, from the framework of inclusive pedagogy. Um, so we have one question from the, um, from the audience. 
Um, and I think one is directed to this specific case. Um, and after that, we will uh, answer or, or, or we'll, we'll give the floor to also um, answer some of the other questions that we have uh, collected. So the question from Tessa Vossa is, is one of the goals of the blogging exercise also to increase students' technolo technology literacy next to increasing students' writing skills and encouraging them to think critically about issues in the community? Saran. Thank you. So yes, Tessa, um, it wasn't until after year one, I took for granted um, the types of students, meaning the generation of students that I was teaching. And I assumed all had a smartphone, all use WhatsApp, and all had some levels of liter um, technological literacy competences. But beyond that, there was limitations, especially when it came to blogging and using social media in agent for agency or activism and so it became a learning outcome in year two when i re-offered um, the same courses or re-offered the assessment in varying courses that we uh, must have our students become fully technologically literate as well yeah perfect thank you so much uh, 